important things that we could do in this um, unfounded times was to make sure that we could communicate with each other, that there was a place for you to be able to ask me your state representative questions and where I could bring people in from the local and the state level who could talk about where we are as a state and as a community and that you know you could rely on the information uh, that you were getting from us. I wanna say thank you to CCTV for making this possible. Um, it has really been um, a foundation of how I've been able to advocate and, and work with my community and communicate. To those of you who have lost loved, loved, loved ones, um, as of last night, uh, we have lost 95 people in our community to COVID-19. Uh, to those of you who have lost loved ones, my, my heart and my prayers continue to be with you. And for the rest of us who are just finding our lives turned upside down and are grieving, just grieving the loss of everyday life and trying to navigate um, how to really connect in this new way of living while keeping each other safe. I wanna say a very special thank you to my guest today. And today's conversation, it really is a crossroads of where I think we are at, um, that is really the, uh, that represents where we are even with this virus. We're seeing uh, this virus play out in ways that have disproportionately impacted low-income communities, have disproportionately impacted um, immigrant communities, and have disproportionately impacted communities of um, minority communities and majority minor minority communities. And I think if we think about the disproportionate impact of this virus, it speaks very much to where we are 400 years later as a nation, where we can to see, continue to see inequities and disparities um, in black and brown communities, in police policing, uh, police brutality, uh, health outcomes, economic outcomes and opportunities, education, the impacts of climate change. We really are at a, at a road. We're really at a crossroads right now um, as a nation. And certainly here in Massachusetts, we have the opportunity to really decide whether or not life before this pandemic started is actually worth going back to or do we have the opportunity to really transform the kind of world, the kind of community that we deserve? Um, and, and quite frankly, that people who've been disproportionately impacted by this, this virus and systemically oppressed by 400 years of white supremacy, uh, we have the opportunity to really build a new future, to build a new life. I, like many of you, if you're not having big feelings that are filled with hope, anger, sadness, fear, um, angst, then you're probably not paying attention to what's happening right outside of your, of your bubble, <laughs> um, or you're hiding from it, or you're not being impacted by it. I wanna say for those who've taken to the streets over the last three weeks, it is incredibly inspiring to see young people who are once again at the helm of leading a nation and demanding change, demanding that life be different than it was. I'm gonna stop at this point and just say uh, a very quick thank you to my, to my guests who are here. I'm gonna ask each of you if you would just give an introduction. We have one hour together and I'm always amazed at how quickly this hour goes by. So we will do an introduction. I will ask you when you wanna have conversations back and forth with me or each other, please jump in. And at the same time, I'll be trying to take as many questions that have been sent to us either earlier or during the Zoom show. If you ask a question and has not been asked, we're doing the best we can to get to them. And any questions that we think would speak to those who are, uh, that you're not the only one who wants that question answered, I'll do my best to get answers back to you as well. So um, I'm gonna start with, um, I'm gonna start with the most familiar amongst us, at least if you're from Cambridge. Um, we are, I am personally, and I know that you are in a community that's so grateful for your leadership, Commissioner Bard. Um, you joined us almost three years ago, hard to believe. It feels like it was just, not that long ago, we were sitting there having lunch um, in your first month here. Um, I'm so grateful for your leadership, your vision, and um, the sacrifices you made to come to the city of Cambridge believing you could actually transform policing. Um, and so if you could just say a little bit more, although I've given you a nice introduction, say a little bit more who you are, um, and then I'll get to other guests and then we'll get to some questions. Hi everybody, my name is Branville Bard. I'm currently the police commissioner for the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts. Born and raised in Philadelphia, I spent 21 and a half years uh, as a member of the Philadelphia Police Department before leaving to run the Philadelphia Housing Authority Police Department. I did that for two and a half years, uh, reformed that department, and an opportunity came open to come to Cambridge. Uh, Cambridge is such a progressive city with a progressive police department, with a reform-minded police department, 
that I thought it was the perfect opportunity to implement some change, some much needed changes in law enforcement. And after 125 interviews, I was lucky enough to get the job and here I am. So thank you. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'm going to ask my, my colleague um, from Western Mass, from Springfield, Representative Carlos Gonzalez, who's also the chair of the Black and Latino Caucus, and has really been at the helm of the momentum and the energy of where we are now um, with important legislation that has been introduced, but also, quite honestly, has been at the helm of important legislation that impacts um, some of the most vulnerable, vulnerable people in our communities throughout the state. And um, I've had the um, distinct honor of working with him on a number of bills. But I want to say, Carlos, thank you for joining us and thank you for your leadership right now. Um, it's incredibly important and people are really curious, what can we do in the Massachusetts legislature to actually make sure we start addressing um, systemic racism, both in our policing and, and throughout our systems. But we'll start with uh, um, the focus of the caucus right now. Uh, thank you, uh, Leader. Thank you always for your support and uh, it's been a uh, really a pleasure to work with you during my four years at the, at the House of Representatives. I'm State Representative Carlos Gonzalez. I'm from Springfield, Massachusetts. I presently sit as the Vice Chair of Community Development and Small Business, also as the Chair of the Black and Latino Legislative Caucus, as well as in the Ways and Means Committee of Ways and Means and Economic Development Committee. I'm so excited to be with you, join you. Uh, Cambridge, a uh, great city that usually leads uh, by example uh, due to the hard work of our, our uh, esteemed uh, legislator. Cambridge, you are so lucky to have a leader in the House of Representatives like Representative Decker. Uh, not only does she uh, extend the voices and amplifies the voices of Cambridge, she extends her hand and support, especially to me as a new legislator but also reaches out and has come out to Western Massachusetts to listen, particularly when it comes to issues of uh, criminal justice reform and all the other issues that are so important, whether you live in Cambridge or you live in Springfield, Massachusetts. So thank you very much for having me on this show and look forward to the dialogue. Thank you, Representative. And also I'd like to say a very special thank you and welcome to Lisa Laguerre, who is the Associate Director for the Institute of Race and Justice at Northeastern University, and who I think is not a stranger to some of the um, initiatives that we in Cambridge, under the guidance and leadership of Commissioner Bard, have taken on. But I know that you have a national point of view, and you also have um, ex uh, extraordinary experience working with children on behavioral health and mental health issues, and all of these are at a crossroads right now. And so I'd like to say welcome, and, and also if you want to take a few, a few seconds to introduce yourself as well. Thank you. Um, first, I just want to say thank you to Representative Decker and your team for um, hosting this forum and this conversation um, and appreciate the invitation to participate. Um, so my name is Lisa Laguerre and I'm the Associate Director of Community Relations for the Institute on Race and Justice at Northeastern University. Um, the Institute is a social justice research center that's um, housed in the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Northeastern University. And we look at how race affects how policies are created and implemented, implemented um, specifically within criminal justice institutions and how these um, policies impact urban communities. Um, what sets us aside and, and causes for our, the way that we conduct our research differently from other institutions that conduct similar research um, is the way and the model that we use um, to implement our research. Um, so we believe in an action-based, community-centered, community partnership uh, model to conduct our research, where um, we believe that the input and expertise of community practitioners, combined with the expertise of social scientists and researchers um, coming together, helps us produce better informed research that is usable research, um, that won't just sit up in a shelf uh, or be published in an article, but that can be used by practitioners on the ground level um, to advocate towards um, social justice and policy reform. So with that being said, I just thank you again for having the opportunity to participate and look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for your work, more importantly. Um, Representative Gonzalez, I'm gonna start with you. I have questions that are coming in left and right. And um, I have been I, I, this might be the largest number of emails that I've ever received. And I have a community that emails me quite a bit. Um, but people are really, I think, hungry and determined to understand what will the legislature do this term to address issues around policing, police brutality, 
and what changes will we make to start protecting the lives of black and brown people in our state? And I know that the caucus um, has put out a statement around 10 points that we can be doing at the federal, the state, and the local level. And if you could talk to us a little bit more about where your focus is, where you think the House um, is looking. You've had some great conversations, I know, with Speaker DeLeo. You've also been really pushing and weighing in on um, the, the governor as well, who came out today. And I certainly know that you've been um, thinking about and looking at some of the legislation that our Representative Miranda has pushed through as well. I'd love to hear your comments and your thoughts about where, where we are, where does that get us, and where do we need to be? Well, uh, first, I think it, it's important to say that uh, the protesters, uh, where, some po where, where many people were uh, criticized, uh, their voices have been heard. And now it's time to take that anger and turn it into action. And the Black and Latino Legislative Caucus is trying to bring everybody to the table to have frank, candid, and sometimes uncomfortable conversation that can address the real core issues, not the symptoms, the core uh, reasons why we are where we are today. So we need to take this tragedy and turn it into triumph through a legislative process that will have meaningful uh, institutional changes that can address um, the cries that many have been uh, asking for for many years. We are concentrating on the police standard of training. Um, Massachusetts is one of the four states that doesn't have a standardized testing and we mean everybody in law enforcement. It's not only municipal police, it's state troopers, it's anybody that carries a badge and takes an oath. And we're also looking to investigate misconduct and do that in an independent body. Make sure that if a bad police officer, which many of our officers uh, that we speak to on a day-to-day -day basis feel um, uh, needs to be, to have an opportunity for them to have due process but also a structure in place that can remove an officer that fails to uh, live up to his or her expect expectation. We, we want to push for duty to intervene. Uh, we saw in Minneapolis um, how officers encouraged by the public to step in and, uh, and change the, the, the mindset or try to intervene when an officer had a knee in the back of a, of a citizen of the United States of America um, for eight minutes and 46 seconds, and nobody, nobody in that uh, police department, in that municipality, had uh, the wherewithal to go in there and intervene on their behalf. So we need to make sure that we have a, uh, within the legislation, we have that duty to intervene. Um, and we also want to ban chokeholds. Uh, obviously, we know with Eric Gardner case, uh, it was something that uh, has been used in the past and has been defended in the past. Uh, no longer can, is that acceptable. And the excessive use of force, we need to be clear as to what excessive use of force is and make sure that we train our officers, support our officers as much as possible because, again, uh, many of the uh, officers do an outstanding job. So we're trying to weed out the bad. Uh, we're working with the unions, uh, and we had um, – a joint statement come out recently, and they support many of the is issues that I am discussing with you here today. And simultaneously, um, when it comes to uh, police and law reform, we have to address the systematic uh, institutional racist policies that continue to exist and keep people, um, particularly communities of color, in, th in the cycle of poverty. So we have to address that to funding appropriate measurements in education, uh, we need to have real uh, continuation of criminal justice reform. We need to provide more funding for education and not for jails. We need to make sure that we can have people live in affordable housing, but also um, that we can transfer wealth by having home ownership programs within the communities of color. Uh, no longer the status quo um, should be allowed, and no longer can we continue to stay quiet and be comfortable with nibbling at the problem. We need to go at it, and we need to root out the problems, but we also have to fund it appropriately to make sure that everybody um, has an opportunity no different than what this country was set up to allow.
and thank you for also talking about, sorry, am I muted? Okay. Um, thank you. And then, and talking about, you know, this is not just one issue when we're done, deal with some issues around policing and then, and then we've actually right. responded to the call, right? Young people have been taking, young people, mm -hmm. and it's been led by young people, predominantly young people of color, but actually what's been amazing is that the diversity of people who are taking to the streets in the middle of a pandemic Right, the recognition that this virus, which is so infectious, is just as lethal as racism and white supremacy, and that black and brown people have been dying, you know, at, at the same rates over the last 400 years at the hands of white supremacy and systems that have been designed to uh, not support them. And so I, you know, want to say to those who are watching and to those who are taking to the streets, um, thank you. We, the urgency, I think, is creating an opportunity for a lot of legislation that's been sitting there to actually start being fast-tracked and focused because this country, and at least this state, is watching what we do. And your leadership and not waiting for, uh, and sitting back and really using this momentum to, to all of our advantages, I want to thank you. Um, Commissioner Bard, I'd love for you to comment on some of the stuff that we're looking at legislatively right now, specifically around policing. Some of those are issues that you've already taken the lead on. And for people who don't know, I, I want people to know that I have relied on you over the last two and a half years to help me look carefully at legislation that has come before us. You have done your PhD work in racial profiling and you specifically came to the city of Cambridge believing that this would allow you the opportunity to really innovate um, what community policing could look like and, and how to really transform it and to address racism head on. And so um, I wanna thank you for being available. You've come to the state house a number of times. You've looked at bills, you've made, even in some of the legislation that's before us, I have shared with you and you have actually jumped on the phone with my colleagues more than once to have these conversations and in informing us. Um, and so I just would love to give you this chance to talk about sort of where, you, where you've been ahead of the curve, where states are. Um, you've also been in places where your colleagues who are in the same positions of power have been very uncomfortable and where you have opposed them and had a public voice very differently than they do, which I think is brave and bold and important because that's not easy to do, I think, when you're a part of um, such a strong fraternity. Um, but you have used your lived experience and your professional and your academic experience to speak out from the moment that you arrived here. So if you could maybe share a little bit about what you think um, where, where Cambridge is and um, where the state is trying to go. So um, thanks, Representative. We know, uh, or we should know that at every key decision-making point in the criminal justice system that minorities, black and brown people are disparately or disproportionately impacted. We know this, um, but sometimes it's a, it's a fact that we, we try to ignore as a profession and we can't. Um, you spoke about prior legislation. One of the areas that we, um, as a community, as a, as a profession, we dropped the ball on is that we didn't support the data collection efforts that you so strongly pushed. Um, I mean, individually, obviously I, I supported them. Um, around the uh, distracted driving hands-free uh, legislation. We know that anytime you widen the net for infractions that we could stop individuals for, that black and brown people are going to be disproportionately impacted when we do that. And yet we didn't put policies in place that are protective. Uh, everything we do, every policy that we implement at the department level and at the state level have to be protective of the public. And I think that that was an area that hopefully we can revisit because we we uh, we fell short there. Um, we know that we need to do these things. We know that we need to uh, continually monitor for what if any differences exist and in how individuals are treated across race. Here in the city of Cambridge, um, one of the beautiful things about this department is that it is progressive and that some things that we look to ban now, like. Uh, more than a decade ago, this department went from being that legal centric uh, department where we gather our authority from statutes um, and ordinances to a uh, community policing philosophy where we gather our authority from the community in the form of legitimacy. So this meant that we had to take a, a complete look at all of our use of force policies and make sure that they were as humanistic as possible. So we banned chokeholds over a decade ago. We made sure that officers knew that they could only use the least amount of force necessary and stress that. We made sure that we banned the use of certain weapons and, and, and certain other holds. 
um, and that we, our policy spoke of the duty to intervene a decade ago, but it, what it did was it told officers what would happen, that they would be civilly and criminally liable for failing to intervene. It did not specifically mandate that they intervene until uh, a week or so ago when it was brought to my attention and we, uh, and through a general order to change that. So we got, we have to address the elephant in the room. Reforms are necessary, they've been necessary, and we have to make sure that we take every chance we have and every effort that we have to implement policies that are protective. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I was saying, Lisa, I had a conversation with a colleague who called me up um, in regards to um, some legislation, both the, um, specifically my colleague, Rep. Miranda's legislation, um, which I think mirrors quite a, some of the things that Cambridge already does. And the commissioner has actually been very helpful in making sure that we, that that legislation, um, that there's no loopholes in there to remove intent um, when it deals with both consequences and, um, and police behaviors. And somebody said, well, I think it's going too far. And I said to this colleague, well, what does that mean to you? It's going too far. Tell me what part of this is going too far. And I could have guessed what some of those things were, but I wanted to hear. And the response was, well, my police commissioner, my police chief, you know, is concerned about this. And my response was, um, quite frankly, um, if we're not actually addressing legislation that makes um, police chiefs uncomfortable, police officers uncomfortable, me uncomfortable, legislators uncomfortable, then we're probably leaving way too much on the table. Um, and we never got to the conversation about specifically what was too much. Um, and, and quite frankly, we would have had all data collection stops and hand-free driving if our police chiefs across the state had not opposed it. So um, and I'm waiting for the emails to come. Um, so because if you're not stopping, if you're not keeping track of all stops, then you're not getting to the ones that actually show a pattern of harassment, right? Because there's no documentation. So I, Lisa, I would ask you, uh, one of the questions, I have a lot of questions here and folks, I'm trying to weave the questions through the conversation, but one of them is how do we restore trust in, um, in the community between the police? And I would say, I'm not sure there was ever trust to begin with for um, black and brown members of our community. That's different than individual relationships, right? Individual police officers who've worked really hard to build trust. A lot of the programming and the funding that we've used has been about building trust. You think about how all that money could go somewhere else if we didn't have to build trust. And why was that trust not there? And if you're, I, I, you know, I'm not a person of color and I know every day when I leave my house, I never have to worry if I'm going to be in trouble or in danger because of the color of my skin. I never have to spend an ounce of mental energy on that. Um, and so, and that's true in all aspects of our society, but particularly when it comes to policing, which can result in the loss of life. So Lisa, I know that you've spent your career really looking at all of these lenses together as they intersect, and I'd love to hear your response. Sure, um, thank you so much. Um, and, and what you're getting at is, is pretty much central um, in addition to the important legislation um, and to a lot of the work that we've done around racial profiling, data collection, um, and, and making recommendations for a citizen oversight model um, for the city of Boston. Um, all of these processes could be in place, but without the trust between community and law enforcement, it almost goes for not. And, and what I say that, um, in the model where we made recommendations for the um, oversight panel for the city of Boston, um, we put in um, practices where people could file complaints um, and, and have an appeals process for, for if they filed a complaint with the local police department and the, the verdict that came back wasn't what they had hoped for, there would be a process in place where they could appeal the decision to a separate entity that was outside of the police. Um, this was very important um, and, and we thought would be uh, the creation of a transparent process where the community would begin to vocalize when they had these instances. But what we found is that the complaint level was very low um, and you know, we asked ourselves the question, well, what, what's at the root of this? And um, at the root of it is this breakdown of trust and communication between community members and law enforcement. I think that um, ways that we begin to address that is by first um, creating spaces where we can acknowledge um, the history and the legacy of um, racial violence that has occurred um, throughout across this country for the past 400 plus years. 
I think that we have to start there. That's the root of, of where it all begins. Um, we can't pick up from the recent events or the recent occurrences of what happened with George Floyd or Breonna Taylor. Um, we have to acknowledge and revisit the past um, to develop a, a shared perspective and understanding um, and create some spaces for honest and hard conversation, um, acknowledgement, and then talk about ways that we can repair and move forward towards um, remedies for the future. And I think that um, that's, that's the way to begin to establish that level of trust and communication. Representative Gonzalez. Again, I wanna say thank you and all your commitment. Um, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic and most of us are sheltering in place unless we have to go out. You've been driving in from Springfield to Boston um, every day to have really long, important conversations. And we've caught you in the middle of your commute. You're, you've pulled over to be part of this conversation. So, so thank you. Um, where do we go from here? You know, people are wondering um, what, what will happen with the governor's bill? What will happen with the, um, the, the, the plan that the caucus has put out that has four bills and Representative Miranda's bill, which is another bill that is coming this way. Um, what do you think will actually happen with with all three of these? Well, this before I just go, I, before we go uh, forward, I, I do want to just recognize the issue you brought up about COVID and what impact it's having in communities, and particularly in communities of color. I think uh, one of the good things about COVID. I don't know if you can hear us, Representative. We can't hear you. What's your... Uh... So, Representative Gonzalez, we can't actually hear you right now. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Can, can, can you hear me now better? I can. Turn your camera yeah. off. Turn there your video you off. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Representative, I think we're gonna come back to you. Um, all right, so technology and uh, I, I will say, oh, are you there? Well, I, I think this would be a lost opportunity to not point out that we have uh, people who live in Western Mass who still don't have equity and access to the same level of internet service that we do um, in Boston, in the greater Boston area. Um, and I know he's on the side there, so he'll come back and join us when he can. Um, but just to say that this is the legislative process, you know, what I, we technically end at the end of July. There is no guarantee that we will end at the end of July. I was listening to a press conference of the governor today who seemed really adamant that the legislature said we were going to be done by the end of July. That's just not true. We have not decided on that. And I know that the, this, this, the several bills that are being looked at are getting a lot of consideration. And um, there's a lot of conversations being led by the Black and Latino Caucus, being led by Representative Gonzalez and also Representative Miranda. And there are many of us who are reaching out to say, how can we best support this work and, and taking their lead, um, but also making sure that we're doing the work that's necessary to support them to make sure that this comes forward. Are you there, Representative Gonzalez? Yes, can you hear me now? Much better, yes, go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I know you had no mentioned worries. about where we go from here. Okay, yeah. where we go. The stars are alive. I don't know if I so got into this piece before I fell off, but about COVID. And yeah, someone's, someone, someone doesn't want us to hear from you. You've got something good to say because it keeps going out. Um, I'm being told, all right. And we're COVID. Uh, it is, no. COVID has uh, brought to the forefront the health. Of you know, I'm sorry, Representative Carlos, this is, this is tough. I'm really sorry. It's, we're, you're, we're not hearing most of what you're saying and that is a loss for, for all of us right now. I'm gonna pivot back to you, Representative. I'm gonna go back to the commissioner and ask him a question. Um, what, and, and Lisa, please jump in as well. 
what role do you think police unions have in this space around reform? And how likely is it that they become the partners that we need? You know, we read a piece from Representative, um, from Mayor Curtitoni in Somerville on the Globe just recently, where he was pretty vocal and strong about how hard it is to have been able to move forward, so even something like, you know, body cameras, which we saw play out in Boston as well. Um, and which I think, you know, so how, how, what is the role of police unions and um, what is our hope for getting them to the table? And then otherwise, could we do this with, with or without them at the table? So it, it's no secret that um, some of our union leaders do us a disservice when they actively resist calls for reform. And you see that more often than you uh, do them being willing partners at the table to make sure that we implement uh, meaningful reform. It, it shows a, a, a tone deafness as to how it helps the profession overall. Um, anything that helps to increase trust with the community literally makes each and every one of their members' job easier out there, you know, as we perform them. You got the trust of the public, then that just makes life easier for, for everyone. So um, that ranting and raving and that active resistance, it, it, it doesn't help. It only hurts. I'm fortunate uh, here in oh, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate in here in here in Cambridge I have less of that uh, active resistance as the, the the culture here is to understand that the department is form reform minded and the city is reform minded. So thank you, Commissioner. Um, yes, what I, what I will say is that um, I feel like in a lot of the work that we've done over the years, we've also been um, confronted with several roadblocks in this country, um, and ways that we've gotten around that is um, through implementing different trainings with different departments who have police chiefs um, who are very progressive and very willing to want to um, embrace cultural change. Um, and even um, at the academy level, um, where the training starts, um, finding um, allies at the academy level, at the department level, where you're able to begin to, to push the envelope around um, bias-based policing or policing in a diverse society, um, um, de-escalating. Um, and even we've done trainings in the past where we, we talked about understanding brain development um, in terms of de-escalating youth violence before um, a situa situation escalates too far. So I do think that um, in this time and in this climate, um, trying to think a little bit outside of the box um, to get around some of the roadblocks that may be presented by the police unions is very important. And having these conversations is a wonderful way um, to begin to explore those options. If I could piggyback off of that for a second. Um, Lisa is part of the Institute of Race and Justice and um, our department took on some training this year uh, led by the Institute of Race and Justice over at Northeastern. Um, and what it was is this historical injustice present policing training. And what it, it, its purpose was to understand the police's role in historical racial violence, meaning turning a, a minority over to, which typically was a black person, over to an angry white mob and those type of things or participating in the lynching of uh, individuals. It was um, uncomfortable training, um, it was, but it was very necessary. And I think it was well received. Um, it's all other purpose was so that we could understand how our role in historical racial justice um, impacted intergenerational trauma in communities still today. So, you know, it's the, the basic premise is you can't, meaningfully move forward and help to shape the future if you don't really understand everything that's happened in the past. So it was, uh, we were the only department in the country to undergo that training. And um, like I said, it was difficult for some, but necessary for all. Thank you. Representative, I think we have you back. Representative Gonzalez. Okay. Um, are, are you there, my friend? So I, I guess one of the things that I would say to both of you, when I look at the legislation that's before us, and I also think about, you know, no. Commissioner, I, I know I, I know a lot of police officers, right? I actually have police officers who've been members of my family. 
Uh, a lot of people I grew up with are, are in the police department, and I would say um, most of them, not all, to be quite honest, but most of them are people who, um, they're, they're public servants, right? They love serving and they build community. Um, and uh, there are a lot of them who I have incredible affection um, and appreciation for as public servants, the amount of, the amount of time. Um, I would say the difference between what they do and I do is that I usually don't risk my life to go and do my job. And that is always on, um, that's always part of the, the contract when you sign up for, um, to be, whether it's police officer or a firefighter, right? Um, they also have the ability to take someone's life away. And I have had conversations with members of your department um, who are incredibly uh, social justice oriented and innovative. And I thought, what would it be like to actually recruit police officers from schools of social work, right? This whole under like, you know, understanding of who goes into policing. And while it's important to get to the unions to the table, we've seen across the country where some of them, some unions have come out quickly, really to criticize and be critical. I mean, even now, and I think about the criticism of um, Rachel Rollins, even like during this pandemic, who has been incredibly clear about um, looking at the issues of racism and white supremacy, and quite frankly, clearing the courts of crimes that really are, uh, are not worthy of, um, of being taken to court, right? It's th these are crimes that are the roots are poverty, the roots are suffering, the roots are mental health issues, addiction issues, and um, and really challenging us. What she's been challenging is a reframing of what um, law enforcement's job really is, and where we are failing as a society to meet people's basic needs. And if you look at where those basic needs are met, what you know, what I mean, we know is there's 400 years that have created systems where that disparity is disproportionately, the need is disproportionately on black and brown people in our country and low income people, right? So um, I, I guess I would ask, um, you know, both of you around sort of what it means to have consequences, because what we're talking about is not waiting for a change of heart, right? This movement right now and the call is not that while training is really important, and it is, and I don't want to underestimate, because the training that you've touched on, if people actually knew the full breadth of that training, I think they would be really inspired by it. Um, so you're not just relying on a change of heart. We're also talking about consequences, right? Consequences of losing your job, consequences of not being able to actually enter into the police department, consequences of not stepping in if you see someone else is actually using excessive force and you don't do anything. And so, um, Lisa, I don't know if you want to comment on this or the commissioner, but what we're talking about is that ultimately that the consequences will be big enough that for those where, uh, because sometimes, you know, we can talk about, you know, uh, um, unconscious bias, but if you are racist, right, and, and every single one of us who was not born a person of color in this country, you know, we're not born racist, but we learn to be racist, and that simply means we learn to think of ways that people of color are not equal, right, and, and dehumanized and unworthy, um, and we won't, but that's a whole other, like, course for, you know, not, not for, for people who are Caucasian who don't get that, right? For people who still don't get what Black Lives Matter is about. And it's simply about, I never have to worry about whether it's the color of my skin that has actually put me in harm's way. Um, can you talk about the role of reforms and consequences in changing um, what, um, who becomes a police officer and, um, and what policing looks like? So, so you said a couple of different things there. But yeah, I, I've long said that you have to raise the cost of bad behavior. You, you simply have to. You have to make it untenable for someone to just stand by and watch bad behavior and not intervene. And, and you have to have serious consequences there. One of our, our problems, as you mentioned, progressive DAs, is one of our problems as a profession is that we treat advocates like adversaries. So, um, and that's a mistake. When you have folks like DACLU or progressive DAs um, coming out with a point, you need to make space for that. You need to be able to listen to that and hear that because all it's going to do at the end of the day, it's have you produce a better product. So it's going to have you go out there and do your job better. Um, that's what it's meant to do. I, I, I think that I understand um, the issues and the, the institutional racism that girds, you know, uh, undergirds criminal, the criminal justice system. And even still in several conversations with the ACLU, um, I've even had an aha moment like, oh, oh interpreted that way. 
in this whole thing. You have to make that the space for that. You can't treat advocates like adversaries. As far as progressive DAs, um, yeah, they're they're needed. They're they're looking at it as the system. They're not saying that I'm not going to prosecute these crimes, but they're saying that historically, these minor offenses have been used to criminalize black and brown skin. So I'm going to default to no. And if there's an overarching reason to charge these charges, then I'm going to go ahead and charge the charges. But I'm just going to make sure that they're not being used as another way to criminalize brown skin. So um, now I, I think you always have to make the space for those um, for the advocates. Thank you. Lisa. Um, just just to kind of agree with your comments, um, Representative, um, that uh, yes, absolutely, trainings are wonderful and there's a space for training and there's a space for repairing of relationships and change of heart. But as you said, um, we're in a place now where legislation and reform is pivotal and critical. Um, there has to be higher levels of accountability and there has to be consequences. Um, as you said, the majority of, of officers that I know in my family, in my community, um, close friends, um, have worked with several um, members of law enforcement over the course of my career are well-intentioned, well-meaning people that get up every day to protect and serve and, and just have an interest in making it through the day safely to return home to their families. Um, but for those specific officers where racism exists and they, they use their position to uh, disproportionately, you know, harm the lives of black and brown people um, or take the lives of black and brown people, there has to be strict consequences put into place as never before um, to ensure that it just does not continue. Um, I do think that consequences relating to um, decertification and, and uh, you know, maybe the reallocation of funds um, as, it, as they are disseminated through police agencies um, are things where people may begin to think differently about their actions and, and stop to think about what's at stake before um, using excessive force or, or you know, other, other, other discriminatory practices that take place. So I, I'm just in full support and agreement of what you say. While trainings and things have been going on um, and we've been very active and involved and, and it could be very effective for those who are like-minded, um, but for those that are not, yes, we are at a place where that is definitely necessary. I, th I think about an example of that, right? Today is the fifth anniversary of the massacre at South Carolina's um, a and uh, e sorry, A&ME Episcopal Church. Um, eight, eight people killed just in worship and, and one, uh, nine people in total, eight, eight worshipers and their pastor. Um, and the treatment of the, um, the murderer there, right? So uh, the young man who murdered, who sat there for an hour waiting to actually murder nine people and the treatment that he received um, for me really is kind of symbolic of, of what the challenges are and where racism is so deeply rooted. He was brought safely out to, to jail. They, they actually brought him fast food, right? This was like, and you think of how many people of color who um, did nothing wrong, who had guns drawn on them. We think about the... Um, the uh, person who wrote, um, who lived in Newton, who recently wrote about his experiences as, as being as mistaken identity at the Whole Foods grocery store um, in Newton and being surrounded with guns like drawn on, on him. Um, I was thinking of uh, uh, former Governor Deval Patrick um, recently wrote a piece um, with others talking about what it meant for him to be pulled over by state troopers while having an African-American state trooper drive him. That was, you know, a moment of pause, but it was actually the comments under that story that started ridiculing him and accusing him of lying, right? For me, that's where the, the systems of deep-seated racism um, really are why we need systems of consequences and rules that really do, um, that, that really systemically hold bad behaviors, right? Whatever the motivation is. Um, but this, so... I, I think, again, you know, Commissioner Bard, you have really been at the forefront of trying to bring those changes into Cambridge, and I know that we're not done. Um, I'm being asked here what I think about um, police officers in schools and the, the you know, um, police budgets. 
Um, I'll say that, you know, when I look at community resource officers in our schools, quite frankly, if there was a, a, a better relationship um, where trust was established, we probably wouldn't have had community school resource officers to begin with, right? And I know I'm gonna say this, we have amazing community resource officers in Cambridge. Every community has police officers in their schools because that's probably who's attracted to work in schools, not, not universally, right? I think of one in particular who happens to be one of my favorite human beings in the world. Um, and I feel very fortunate, our family feels very fortunate that our kids have a relationship with him. But it still begs the question, why police are in our schools and is that the best and highest use of money when we spend more money on police officers in schools than we do with schools that don't have librarians or don't have social workers uh, i mean and start naming of all the things that they don't have um and looking at how we have a more thoughtful budget where um you know we ask um, some police departments to do a lot to do a lot more than they would have to do if those relationships were um were not broken um, Commissioner, do you have any comments about what has recently happened in terms of looking at um, your budget and the conversations that you are having with city leadership as and getting um, a number of people who have either followed some of it or just want to know more about your thoughts on that? So, you know, a lot has happened with the defund movement and for whatever that means, if, if defund means abolished, then I don't think that there's any uh, historical or uh, lots of scholarly support for it. If it means reallocate, then okay, maybe let's have thoughtful discussions about that. And I've, I've already said, if it means reform, then yes, absolutely. We know uh, that that's necessary. But when you look at things like uh, school resource officers, community resource officers, we're real thoughtful about um, and real intentional about calling them youth resource officers because our officers spend time in the rec centers with our children in the neighborhoods with our children, and then yes, in the schools with our children. But as bridge builders, we, we I mean, quite frankly, we rarely arrest a child. We understand that we, we focus on prevention, intervention, and diversion. We understand that and we know that if you introduce a child to the juvenile justice system, then that child is seven times more likely to enter the criminal justice system as an adult. So it just makes sense not to do everything you can to be protective and not introduce the children to uh, the juvenile justice system. So we have this national model um, safety net program where, you know, we it's a partnership between the, the police department, the schools, human service programs, and Cambridge Health Alliance. And it, if a child shows criminal behavior or troubling behavior, we provide wraparound services, not just for that child, but for their entire family. And that case manager that they get they stay with that child throughout their life course and um, create just meaningful relationships. So here we, we take that protective stance that um, of our juveniles that we need to take um, globally through policy, through, through practice, um, through statutes of black and brown communities that, that a lot of the defund talk is, is meant to protect. So Lisa, I see you shaking your head. I think the defund movement means, as people have talked, it means a lot of different things. Yes. Um, and so I, I saw you shaking your head if you wanted to comment. Yes, um, I, I would just say, um, kind of reiterating what the commissioner just said, um, from the academic or uh, academic institution standpoint and from many conversations that I've had um, in community circles with community-based agencies um, in terms of what defund means, um, if we're talking about the the complete defunding of law enforcement departments, that's that's not something that I'm hearing that people are on board with at all. Um, the police play a vital role in function with which out, um, I think uh, you, you, things would be far worse than they are. Um, I think as commissioner said, talking about maybe the reallocation of funding and into reform, into training, into um, different supports um, and what that means are conversations that should be brought um, to the table. Um, and, and so with that in mind, I, I also wanted to say um, with regards to thinking about the importance of school police resource officers, um, specifically as I see it within communities of color, I do think that um, for, for most communities of color and young people that they play a pivotal role because um, that may be the first real life positive experience that they have with the law enforcement officer. And if, 
in our department, we had done um, a survey a couple of years back where we surveyed a lot of um, youth in the Roxbury, Dorchester area just to get a gauge on um, perceptions of law enforcement. And across the board, mostly everyone that we interviewed had a negative perception of law or, or gave us a negative perception of law enforcement. But the, uh, the ironic part of it is that none of them had actually had a real live experience, negative experience or a positive experience with a police officer. So this was based on perceptions. This was based on things they'd see on the media, things that they've heard from family members, things that they may have heard from friends, things that they would hear in music. Um, so I, I say that to say that perceptions create reality. And uh -huh. so having a real life interaction with an officer that takes an interest in your life and acts differently from maybe what you've heard or learned um, can be life-changing in terms of a young person and their development and their perceptions of law enforcement. So I think that there's definitely a need, continued need. Thank you. And I, and I think one of the things that's important um, is that as we have these conversations about looking at our budgets, because budgets are going to become more and more important as we are in the middle of an economic depression right now. Mm -hmm. And I think that using data and having informed conversations is really important because while it might be easy to say, take this out of the police department, I don't think some of this is a matter of like, today you have it, tomorrow you don't. It's really a reimagining of what kind of a community and society we want and, and who's actually funding, who's being funded to, to build that kind of society. And I know that there's been programs within our own police department that have actually come up because there was a vacuum. There was a vacuum around sort of youth engagement, right? So that becomes a program from somebody in the department who cares deeply about building a, a better relationship with youth who's been able to start that program. So it is gonna be really important that as we try to use this opportunity to reimagine what uh, not only the changes in policing that are gonna occur, but when we look at our budgets, and I would say police budgets, but all of our budgets, are we spending our money in ways that are maximizing our values to, to get us to, to, be, to, to, to have the kind of community that we want? You know, do we value mental health? Well, how, how do we show that? Who's working with our families and who's working in our schools? Um, and so those kinds of conversations, but what I really appreciate about you, Lisa, and the work that your institute does and what the commissioner has been doing for the last three years is really um, being far more methodical and thoughtful about like examining what, um, what our policies are, what, our, what the consequences are, and if switching this lever actually gets us to where we wanna be, because sometimes it doesn't. Um, so Representative uh, Gonzalez, are you still with us? I can hear you loud and clear, but I can't see the, the video. Okay, well, we can hear you now and we have about 10 minutes left. So I'm gonna to try to actually pivot back to you. Okay. Um, you started to say something. So I want you to come back to you. You started talking about where we are in the pandemic. Right, well, we are in the pandemic. One of the good things about uh, the pandemic has been is that is, it's brought us to see clearly that uh, no matter where you reside and no matter what zip code you live, we are all interconnected and my health is connected to an essential worker's health and his or her health has an impact in everybody else's health. So we need to be uh, clear about that because as we address, address the health disparities, we need to make sure that somebody that's an essential worker that's making minimum wage needs to be afforded the health care necessary, not only to protect themselves and their families, but everybody they interact with, as well as folks that can afford Health, uh, health care. That's important. Uh, the other thing, I, I think you also asked about where the legislation, where are we with the legislation? Uh, as, as you know, the governor has um, initiated a, a bill. It's, most, uh, it's one of the points of the 10-point systems that we have addressed uh, approximately about a month ago. Um, it is one step in the right direction. It starts the conversation. Um, like you had mentioned, it's not a one and done. This is a conversation that needs to get uncomfortable. Uh, we need to uh, talk about, and, and I know the commissioner and, 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 and the other guests have, have mentioned about licensing. I, I think the unions prefer certification and decertification. I have no problem with that. If we can license somebody that is your manicurist, um, and then we should be able to license somebody that carries a gun and has the right to uh, take your life away. So that, uh, 
step in the right direction by the governor is uh, again the beginning. We have confidence in the commitment of the Speaker of the House, who has committed uh, early on um, to an independent body for transparency and accountability when uh, police misconduct has to be uh, reviewed. We are also uh, confident uh, and comfortable that the Senate President has also uh, set up a, a working group to address some of the same issues and both have agreed to move this bill expeditiously. We all know we have a limited time to get this bill done through this legislative session. There's 45 days uh, approximately left. We need to uh, be able to uh, implement the necessary amendments to a, a bill, but also be able to get it through the House and Senate through, with robust discussions about how we can improve it and how we can address the, uh, the, the other issues that have nothing to do with policing, but are the cost effects of dealing with um, the economic uh, uh, inequalities that exist in communities of color. Uh, once the bill gets through the House and Senate, obviously we need 10 days to get that before the governor. So we should have a bill no later than July 20th and July 21st, which gives him 10 days to review. And we have enough time just in case there's a veto uh, that occurs that we can come back in the House and Senate and be able to override that veto. This is a great time to turn this triumph into uh, this tragedy into triumph. And uh, many folks believe that we are here because of uh, what happened in Minneapolis. No, we are here because of the cries of George Floyd, uh, because of Rodney King and, and Eric Gardner and, and, and the, the, the slaves that came on the slave ship and even our Native American brothers uh, prior to this country started. So these cries have been heard loud and clear. Now it's time to act. Now it's time to turn the prayers into action. And I'm looking forward to be working with you. Uh, you are a strong voice, will continue to be. And we at the Black and Latino Caucus will work with all our colleagues in both House and the Senate, as well as our unions and, uh, and, the, and the advocates who have been at the forefront of this discussion uh, since the beginning to make sure that this happens. Representative Gonzalez, that was worth waiting for. Um, I'm, I'm so glad you were able to reconnect with us. And, you know, I, I said that this time goes by really quickly. So I, I want to thank you for your incredible leadership. And I want to thank you also, while you're in this moment leading this, th these important changes that the legislature has the opportunity to really quickly um, write some of history in systemic ways that I think will save people's lives. You've also been an important partner for me and leader in also addressing a lot of other issues where systemic racism, white supremacy, a history of 400 years has made it um, uh, where we have extremely outcomes for people of color in this country, both in the environment, um, health outcomes, education, economic opportunity. And so while today we focus a lot on um, racial justice in policing because of bills that are before us, we also know that this work actually, that these questions of how is this impacting the disparities between black and brown people um, and, and white people in this country, how are we writing those ways? That, that has to be a lens that we use for every piece of legislation, every piece of legislation that we ask. And it's not just up to the Black and Latino Caucus to be leading the way. Every single legislator has a responsibility to use those lenders, lenses to address disparity because it touches all of our lives. And we know that the reason why this pandemic has disproportionately impacted Black and Brown communities is because of the, uh, because of, quite frankly, because of racism and white supremacy that have created systems that have put them at a disadvantage for 400 years, um, creating greater harm. So I want to thank you for your leadership. I want to thank um, Commissioner Bard for his incredible work and leadership. I think he has a really important and hard job, and he has shown us that he is more than capable and wants to be in that, that role of leadership. Um, Lisa Laguerre, I can't thank you enough for not only joining us today, but for the, the incredible work that you do and the lenses of looking at the issues of justice, race, mental health and well-being, and law enforcement and policing, and, and recognizing that we need to find a way to support those in law enforcement um, to be able to do their job in ways that are safer, because the majority of people do want to do that. Um, also recognizing that we need to change the rules and have consequences to ensure that that is the outcome more often than not. So for those of you in Cambridge who are watching, I want to say thank you. If we did not get to all of your questions, um, I'm sorry. We will try to answer them. 
separately. And if we can, we'll send them out in my nightly email. Um, if you are not on my nightly email, every night we do send out an email trying to keep people posted of what's happening locally in the state as it relates to the state of emergency. Um, and we will be back next week at our regular time at four o'clock for our next town hall. Please do not hesitate to reach out, ask me questions and um, my office and my staff, my incredible staff, we are here to serve and to try to help all of us navigate these very troubling times, but very hopeful and inspiring opportunity in our life to really have the, the communities and the societies that everyone deserves, not just some. Thank you. Thank you.